Welcome back to the Resources Conservation and Recycling webinar program. As you're probably tired of hearing, my name is Mitchell Jones. I'm the Outreach Editor at Resources Conservation and Recycling. I'm your host, as always. It's a pleasure to have you all here with me today and with Monica. So a big welcome to Monica. Thank you very much for joining us today, Monica. Um, just to touch on a couple of uh, points on the program before we start. So this is the English language webinar program from the Elzevia Journal Resources Conservation and Recycling. <clears throat> we also have a Chinese language webinar program. So if you speak Chinese and you're potentially interested in that, be sure to check that out. This program runs every second Thursday at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. It is covering the entire scope of the journal. So you can expect to find presentations on a really wide range of different topics. Uh, everything from, uh, well, we have quite an extensive list of, uh, of, of topics there. I encourage you all to have a look and, and to participate in webinars that potentially might not necessarily be uh, your research area, but might be an adjacent research area. Uh, the reason being, one of the main points for this program is accessibility. We aim to really provide accessible webinars and we, we really request that our speakers uh, bear a broad audience in mind when they, when they are presenting, uh, you know, that they're presenting the context, um, not using too much jargon, trying to provide some fundamentals, some foundational information, uh, in addition to, of course, their research findings, just so that people can uh, can use this webinar experience to to learn and and explore other people's research areas as, as well as of course the uh, the people that are very experienced in the research areas to get the latest updates on what's going on so this program is uh via registration um it's obviously free but uh you need to register for it you can find the registration links in the resources conservation and recycling newsletter that is circulated at the end of each month. You can also find the links on our social media pages, the official Resources Conservation and Recycling social media pages, which are on X, LinkedIn, and Facebook. In addition to that, you can also get the links uh, on the, the journal homepage. So if you go to the Resources Conservation and Recycling journal homepage on the Elzavia website, you will find under the About menu the webinar calendar. And there you will find uh, all of the previous webinars. They are all listed there, in addition to the upcoming webinars. In terms of viewing options, you also, apart from the, the Zoom environment here, where you're actually able to interact with our speaker, which is today Monica, uh, and ask your questions and such, you also have the option to view the, the live stream of this on YouTube. So if you visit our YouTube channel, uh, youtube.com forward slash at symbol rcr journal you can view the exact same content you're seeing here it's just that you cannot uh, ask questions and of course you can also see all the old webinars so all of the existing webinars are all archived to youtube so you can be you can be you're able to uh, check those out as well the only final point is that we really appreciate any feedback that you might have on our program we really do want to create a program that you want to watch so if you want to provide us with any feedback on uh, on what we are doing well, what we're doing badly, what we could improve on, we would love to hear from you. You just need to uh, fill in the survey at the end of the webinar. At the end of the webinar, everybody will have the chance to submit a response to the survey if they like. It's just a few questions, just five or six questions. It will only take you a couple of minutes to complete if you're interested in doing that. Okay. So without further ado, I will uh, switch over to our program for today. So we've had our welcome address. I'm going to briefly introduce the journal. I'm going to then introduce Monica, our speaker for today. And a few points, a few housekeeping uh, issues or, or, or concerns for, for the day or for all of our programs actually. Uh, then we're going to have a presentation, approximately 20 minutes from Monica, then approximately 10 minutes of question time, and then some information about the next event and some closing remarks. So in terms of our journal, you're hopefully familiar with 
uh, our journal Resources Conservation and Recycling. It's an Alzavia journal. This scope is really in the name. We're very interested in resources, conservation and recycling with specific points on uh, systems-wide strategies, technological, economic, institutional and policy focus, resource management practices, conservation, recycling and resource substitution, resource productivity improvement, restructuring of production and consumption profiles and transformation of industry. So if you have any great research in those areas, we would love to see it in our journal. So just housekeeping, um, all communication today, please in English, just because this is an English language program. We do have other options available, but this is an English language program. So just so that everyone can communicate with each other in a common language, please stick to English. Uh, we do have closed captions available at the moment. So if you want to watch the program muted, uh, well, with no sound, or uh, you would benefit from uh, some captions because English is potentially not your first language or any other reason, you feel very free to use those captions if you would like to. Uh, if you have any questions, be sure to post them in the Q&A over the course of the presentation from Monica. And if you see a question there that you think is a particularly good question or is the sort of question that you might have asked or that you'd be interested in hearing the answer to as well, then be sure to upvote it. We also will have the capability for you to ask your question directly. So if you would like to speak to Monica via camera and microphone or just microphone, um, we can accommodate that. You just need to raise your hand over the course of the presentation. You can do that with the, the hand raised um, um, feedback, the, the reaction, sorry, the raised hand reaction in your toolbar. And if we have excess time, so we have 10 minutes for questions approximately. And if we have excess time, we'll be more than happy to have you uh, speaking directly to Monica on the floor. So then the introduction of our speaker for today is Monica Varga from the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences. She's going to be speaking with us on the topic of process structure pathway analysis for conservation supporting coordinated assembly and disassembly. So Monica Varga, PhD, is an agricultural engineer who works as a senior researcher at the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Her research work focuses on the modeling and simulation of process systems at various fields and scales. Her multidisciplinary experiences come from applications in chemical and pharmaceutical industry, followed by modeling of biosystems, ecosystems, watershed, agri-food, and agricultural process systems. She was a Fulbright research scholar at the Ohio State University. Her recent research focuses on the development and implementation of the general modeling framework of programmable process structures. The new applications relate to model-based analysis, planning and operation of complex agricultural, aquacultural and agro-environmental systems. So a big welcome to Monica. Thank you so much for being with us today, Monica. Uh, I will now stop screen sharing so that you are able to do so. Thank you so much, Mitch, and uh, hello, everyone. First, I will share my screen, and uh, would you so kind to give a feedback whether you see it, my presentation in presentation mode? Perfect. So hello, everyone, and uh, first of all, uh, many thanks for this kind invitation. It is really a great honor for me to be a part of uh, this RCR webinar program. And uh, today I will give a deeper insight into a recent work that was published uh, in Resources Conservation and Recycling. And uh, basically it is uh, focuses uh, on the analysis of natural process systems. And uh, we try to derive some uh, basic principles that makes natural systems uh, more sustainable. And uh, we try to analyze the, the human-made processes in terms of how, how we can adopt uh, these sustainability-specific uh, principles into them uh, to reach uh, higher level sustainability. And 
authors of this paper uh, were basically two chemical engineers and two agricultural engineers. So it is an interdisciplinary topic. And uh, two authors are from uh, the Hungarian University of Agriculture and Life Sciences from our institution. And uh, it was prepared in collaboration uh, with two colleagues from Ohio State University. So let me start uh, with our standpoint that natural biosystems and ecosystems are more sustainable and resilient inherently. And uh, if we have a look at the literature, we can find uh, many papers and increasing number of papers about this topic. And uh, our objective was uh, to analyze natural systems with the help of process models and uh, process structures. And uh, we were curious about uh, to discover those structural principles that makes these natural systems uh, more sustainable. And uh, in the today discussion, uh, I will focus on the question of maximal pathways and uh, how these natural and maximal pathways uh, that appears in natural systems can be adopted for, for the design and control of uh, cyclic assembly disassembly processes in, in uh, basically human-made systems. So regarding the content of my today presentation, I will follow the graphical abstract of our paper that uh, refers to these three main blocks, uh, namely the, the investigation, investigated natural systems, the derived structural principles, and uh, the analysis for building these principles into the uh, human-made systems. But before introducing these examples, uh, let me start with the clarification of uh, three basic principles and basic notions. The first one is the notion of conservation and conservation-based measures. And uh, usually conservation law is well known in physics. And uh, in our suggested axiomatic definition, uh, basically it is very simple. If we have a system denoted with V, and it has a universal complement denoted per U per V. In this case, the constant measure CI uh, can be interpreted as a measure. And if there is a change uh, within this system in this measure, it is always accompanied by the same change at the universal complement with opposite signal. And derived from this constant measure, we can define the conservational measure. Uh, so the conservational measure uh, is the constant measure that multiplied by the stoichiometric co coefficients of the given system. So this is the first basic notion. The second one uh, is the structure of conservational and informational processes. Here, along our analysis, I will use the process structure uh, that basically was defined by Petri well before the well-known Petri nets. And here in this case, the S represents the states, the measures within the analyze system, and T, the transitions, represent the transformations and transportations of elements within the analyze systems. And between the states and transitions, there are edges that determines the decrease and increase of the measures. Uh, during our analysis, we use a modified version uh, of this general net, uh, which is modified in two steps. In the first step, the modification refers to the edges. And in this modified version, we differentiate the simple edges and uh, regarding the state transition edge, uh, we interpret it as reading of information about the states. And uh, regarding the transition state edges, we differentiate uh, increasing uh, solid and decreasing dashed edges. And in the next step, uh, we change the state and transition elements to all specific elements that are prepared for contain uh, the equations and other functionality related informations 
that needs to describe the dynamic behavior of the system. So along our presentation, I will use this programmable process structure uh, that we used for modeling the various process systems. Yes, and uh, regarding PPS, it is a non-conventional framework uh, and general methodology developed by our group. And uh, basically, the PPS model's characteristic can be uh, uh, explained very briefly that it follows the causal structure of, of a given analyzed process net. It is prepared to contain the functionalities so it means that uh, with the addition of uh, underlying equations in form of program codes, it can calculate dynamically the actual behavior of the system. And uh, the executable prototype programs calculate uh, the outputs, all the outputs in the knowledge of inputs and parameters. It is implemented in a... Uh, SVI prologue language, uh, the experimental application, and a more detailed introduction can be found uh, via uh, this link in this paper. And the third notion is uh, the maximal pathways of process structures. It basically means that uh, we have two types of maximal pathways. The first is a complete transferring pathway it is very easy to understand within this simple example. One transferring route can be uh, highlighted with these blue lines. It means that its first element is an input and the last element is an output. And the second type is a complete cycle. It means that the first and the last element exactly the same. So it forms a complete cycle. Of course, it is uh, very uh, easy to understand with, with these small examples, but in a larger system, uh, it's automatic uh, search and, and generation is, is very important. So uh, regarding the analysis of uh, example systems, let me start uh, with two cell organs, the chloroplast and the mitochondria that exist, exist in the plant cell, the chloroplast, and the chloroplast and the mitochondria, uh, and the mitochondria, sorry, exist in the animal cell. So uh, regarding this picture about these two cell organs, it uh, represents the main functionality, namely that the chloroplast utilizes the solar energy and uh, produces oxygen and uh, the biomass, and uh, oppositely, uh, the mitochondrium uh, as a respiration, via the respiration, uh, utilizes oxygen and biomass and produces the energy for the life. So uh, when we started to analyze uh, the main process systems uh, within these two cell organs, we started from the biochemical pathway maps and uh, fr started from the CAG database. And uh, we extracted those important uh, state describing and transition describing element uh, that characterize this, the behavior of these two organs. It is not important to read all of these elements, but the main point here, point here that there are 16, 16 state elements were derived and the nine, nine transition elements in both systems that describe the, the behavior uh, of these two organs. And uh, if we build the process structures utilizing these 16 uh, states and nine transition elements, we can analyze the behavior of the system. So starting from the chloroplast, it utilizes the solar energy and the water and produces uh, the oxygen. Oppositely, in the mitochondrial side, it utilizes the oxygen and produces the heat energy. And of course, the, all the additional processes uh, are appear, that appears are symmetrical. And uh, here in the chloroplast side, we have the Kelvin cycle and the ADP, ATP pump. And similarly, the other side contains uh, the ADP, ATP pump and the TCA, or 
uh, TCA cycle. And in addition, which is very important, uh, the chloroplast utilizes the environmental CO2 and produces the carb carbon hydrogen oxygen pool, namely the new biomass. And the other side, the mitochondria utilizes uh, biomass and produces uh, the carbon dioxide via the respiration process. So, which is uh, very interesting uh, within these analyses that uh, the system can be characterized by five five complete transparent glutes and four four complete cycles in both sides. And uh, if we have a look at this structure, we can recognize that both structure symmetrically contains the same cycles, but with an opposite direction. If we have a look at this, it, it signed by these color lines. Regarding the transferring routes, uh, it starts from the environmental H2 and ends with the environmental O2 in the chloroplast side and oppositely at the mitochondrial side. So basically, these uh, systems are not connected uh, at this level, but at an ecosystem level, it is uh, connected and the overall oxygen, carbon dioxide, and CH composition and decomposition pool are measured. Uh, and another example at the hydrogen-related uh, cycle within this system, again, at ecosystem level, it forms a complete cycle. Regarding the next environmental-related example is the case of coexisting trees and plants. And uh, in this case, we analyzed in former works uh, the coexistence of trees and plants. And for this quantitative analysis, we prepared and uh, developed a process-based model that was compartmentalized based on the three compartments, namely the leaves, branch, pole, phloem, psyllium, and the two types of root, the main root and fine root. And similarly, at the plant side, uh, following the uh, phenological stages of the plant. Uh, regarding the atmosphere, uh, we considered uh, the meteorological processes, the sunshine, uh, the necessary uptake, photosynthesis, evapotranspiration, respiration, growth, littering, and decay processes. And at the soil side, uh, we described uh, the site flow, the seepage related processes, and the air land uh, interactions between the atmosphere and the soil. So, in this case, if we derive this picture into this state transition net, uh, we can analyze uh, quantitatively the system. Uh, first, as we have the structure, we have to uh, complete it with the underlying functionalities, and uh, it will provide us a process model, an a priori process model. Of course, I will not go uh, into the details in this uh, quantitative uh, formulation because our aim today is the structural analysis and to derive the structural principles. Here in this tree and plant uh, collaboration, one important thing is, uh, for example, the phosphorus pathway, uh, namely that the trees are able to take up the phosphor from the lower layers of the soil. And uh, through the uh, uptake process it, uh, and the, the photosynthesis pro pro process, uh, it is embedded uh, in the various parts of the plants. And through the littering, it goes back to the soil. Uh, we are the site flow, uh, the collaborating plants, the, the um, neighboring plants able to take up, and similarly uh, through the photosynthesis process and uh, the growth process, they embed it uh, to their parts. And uh, with the harvesting, uh, it ends in the crop. So these and the similar kind of uh, natural process structure analysis led us to derive some structural principles 
namely that uh, conservation is realized by cyclic pathways and uh, uh, the lower scale transferring pathways usually and almost always form cycles at the upper scales, as I mentioned in the mitochondrium and chloroplast example. In the lower scale, uh, there is always a very restricted set of fundamental components and uh, it supports highly the effective recycling uh, behind the evolution driving, driving biodiversity. And here we can mention uh, uh, ADP, ATP, or 20 amino acids uh, as a viable uh, example. Another important point is that nature is prepared for the buffering storages that uh, give a fundamental basis to, to support the resilience against uh, uh, the sudden fluctuations and the slow environmental changes too. And uh, the last one, that there are coordinated structural patterns of uh, assembly and disassembly. And uh, here we uh, saw the example of chloroplast and mitochondria uh, and the photosynthesis drive and growth or versus the evapotranspiration drive and uh, respiration in the plant and tree system. So our question was, how can we apply, or uh, is it possible to apply uh, these basic principles uh, in the human built systems. And for uh, to find answer for these questions, uh, we analyzed it through three examples. And first was the hydrogen uh, related energy, which of course it, it is a natural evidence uh, and it is an important source of energy uh, in the future. And usually uh, hydrogen is utilized uh, as a storage for the fluctuating uh, energy from come from the solar, uh, the hydropower, uh, the wind photovoltaic related systems. And uh, the problem here is that uh, these systems are fluctuating highly. Uh, formerly in a paper, we prepared uh, an estimation considering some climate scenarios. And here we can see that uh, uh, it is an always fluctuated amount uh, that are prepared through, through these uh, renewable systems. Here uh, in the hydrogen uh, serves as a storage, as a buffering storage. And through the process of electrolysis, uh, it, from water, it produces the hydrogen with electrical en energy. And uh, of course, uh, during the utilization, it, it is a complete emission-free uh, energy that uh, produces only uh, water. So here we can recognize as a natural evidence the main cycle of hydrogen that uh, uh, that uh, produces only water within this cycle, and also there is a main transferring route uh, from the sorry from here from the solar energy. As a next example, uh, it is a more detailed uh, calculation that was prepared uh, from a former case study. It is the case of uh, grocery bag uh, recycling, and here uh, we derived the structure of an LCA model into a dynamic uh, process model to consider also the storages and the dynamic behavior of the system. And here we started uh, from the raw material production until the, uh, until the utilization and uh, recycling selection of uh, grocery bags right until the land load, water load, and, and air load. And here, during this analysis, uh, we considered 17 uh, state and seven, 17 transition elements. The transition elements always refer to the, to the actual processes uh, that are embedded and considered in the system. And regarding the plastic, uh, we considered uh, or the um, grocery bag uh, material, we considered PP, HDPA, LDPA, PLA, and paper. So 
Uh, after transforming it to a structural uh, but a priori process model, we were able to, to follow the dynamic behavior of the system and uh, an interesting example here. If, for example, we produce lumber or clinker uh, from the waste plastic, it uh, appears here in the system and uh, at the same time the landfill amount of landfill is decreases. But after the end of life of this lumber and clinker, it appears again in the landfill. So it is again not the best solution, but but it is something. So as a as the last example and probably the most interesting one is an emerging challenge: uh, the recycling of uh, rare elements from e-waste and. Uh, I'm sure that everybody knows the numbers that uh, more than 50 million metric tons of e-waste is generated, and it is expected to increase by 2030. And only a minority uh, of this e-waste is recycled and collected appropriately. And uh, especially the rare elements are limitedly available, so it, it became a huge problem to supplement uh, these rare elements in the future. So in this case, uh, if we start from the structural analysis, uh, from the raw material uh, production and uh, the production of electronic goods, uh, the product the utilization and uh, after the end of life, uh, the primary selection, uh, it can be described as, by a structure like this. And here, if we have some uh, selected areas, there are various types of rough preprocessing, uh, fine processing, purification, and final processing uh, that are able to, uh, to recycle the original material back in an ideal case uh, to the production again. And of course, uh, in each step, we have several uh, options that definitely need a quantitative analysis to support the proper planning uh, of these systems. It is the point when a structure-based process model can help. And uh, if we want to, to uh, formulate uh, some advices for this kind of uh, systems, First is that stepwise assembly process always should be uh, accompanied uh, by the proper description of stoichiometric composition of the parts at the processing stage. At the um, uh, decomposition stage, uh, this can orientate the proper decomposition and also uh, it helps the initial, initial rough preprocessing. Uh, the size and composition. Oh, sorry. The size and composition of uh, buffer storage must properly planned according to, according to the needs of purific purification process, and it is again a point that can be effectively supported by quantitative process models. Available effective uh, final separation method uh, uh, must give a feedback uh, for the more appropriate rough separation and classification. And um, assembly uh, should avoid those irration irrational diversification, uh, which can cause extra difficulties uh, during the disassembly processes. And those are dynamic balance model can detect uh, accumulations and leakages uh, during the, the whole system if we follow it quantitatively. So uh, regarding some uh, ongoing methodological development, uh, to support this kind of uh, uh, assembly and uh, disassembly, uh, we plan to embed uh, stoichiometric tree in our process models that uh, can be applied uh, independently from the field of application, uh, for example, for, for an electronic device or for the description of an agricultural parcel, if we step-by-step step describe the underlying stoichiometries and uh, embed it within our uh, process models. So regarding uh, the measure and the parallel management of measure and information within our modeling tool, uh, this information can be embedded as an information flow 
uh, along the whole process. And regarding uh, some ongoing and planned applications, this kind of uh, stoichiometric uh, based work uh, are in process regarding uh, nutrient flows and uh, for complex plant cultivation models uh, regarding crop rotation of uh, uh, given uh, agricultural area with cover plants. It is in collaboration with OSU. There are uh, ongoing work uh, regarding the stoichiometric uh, consideration in rush and plant models, and those um, uh, food web involved fish pond model with surrounding grid within a Marie Curie PhD study at our university. And as I mentioned, uh, it is an interesting uh, future challenge uh, to work on this e-waste related recycling problem with process models. So. Thank you, and uh, I'm here for the questions. Thank you so much, Monica, for that presentation. It's uh, this is completely different to my area of research, and it's uh, it's very very interesting to see this kind of uh, modeling. It's it's uh, it's quite amazing what you can do. And it, it seems to have a sort of biomimetic aspect to it, right? So you're, you're using, uh, well, sorry, I will just say now that uh, obviously if anyone would like to ask any questions, they can, I see that we already have one. If anyone is uh, interested in asking a question, be sure to ask it now. I'm just uh, <laughs> venting a little myself. I have a few things to ask Monica and myself. Um, so you basically use these natural processes, so the, the chloroplast and things and the mitochondria that you discussed, you use those to develop your models. Uh, these these mitochondria and chloroplast uh, related processes were only examples because mm -hmm. formerly we utilized our modeling tool for the quantitative a priori model of quite different process systems. First, uh, it was used mainly for pharmaceutical processes uh, because it is a unified method and independently from the underlying systems, it is able to uh, to describe the physical, chemical, biological properties of the underlying system with a, within a unified tool. And that's why uh, we were lucky to, uh, to work with quite different process systems, uh, natural systems amongst them. And uh, here we get the idea uh, that that natural systems are are more sustainable, and uh, and what are those structural features that that make them more more sustainable? And it was the point where we we tried to somehow collect this information together and uh, and uh, to try to to involve also the human made systems. It's very interesting. So, for um for a layman, for somebody that didn't know anything about this. How do you actually go about building this model? I mean, we saw the graphical representations, but if you were to describe how you do it for, for your average person, how would you describe the way that you do it? Yes, basically, as I mentioned, it is a structural tool. So when you start with a cognitive model, first you define your states and transitions that characterize uh, the underlying system you want to analyze. And uh, when you have this description, temporarily we use an Excel uh, VBA supported interface to input this structure. And the next step, when you have the structure, you have to fill it with the underlying functionalities. Let me let me say an example. For example, you want to, to describe the process of photosynthesis. Uh, in the structure, you will need information about the meta actual meteorological situation, the actual amount of leaf biomass, uh, the, the oxygen concentration in the system, the carbon dioxide concentration in the system. So it is structurally uh, known by the, uh, it is defined by the structure. And after that, uh, as I showed, these state, both the states and transition elements have empty spaces to store this kind of information. And uh, all the equations are uh, can be added behind these structural elements in form of program codes. 
So these program codes are responsible for the calculation of all elements. But of course, uh, it gives from one side the flexibility, but from the other side, you are responsible to, to write the underlying processes. So it is how it works briefly. So actually, you've just touched on the that final point that you made sort of uh, was actually something else that I wanted to ask you. So obviously, this is one way of modeling things. I assume there are obviously other ways of modeling things. What are the main sort of advantages and disadvantages of your modeling process compared to other modeling processes? Yes, it is a good question. Thanks. And uh, our main point here that uh, this kind of tool uh, allows the unified modeling of quite different systems. And uh, here in the in sense of the circular systems, there is a urgent need to couple the, the quite different submodels of the system. And uh, it is the, the advantage of our tool that as it uh, offer a unified representation of quite different systems, uh, it makes possible to, to couple and consider quantitatively together the quite different parts. And of course, uh, it is, as I mentioned, it is an in-house use tool and the development. So it is the disadvantage part that uh, it needs a more advanced uh, user-friendly interface that we are working on. Would you consider making this sort of like an open source type tool to try to get other people developing it? Yes, definitely. It, it is the, the goal to, to develop toward this direction. The other thing that I was wondering, um, does your modeling process make any assumptions or simplifications? Is it completely accurate? Yes, uh, the question of simplification, uh, to allow to couple the quite different systems, you always need uh, to, to determine an appropriate level of detailness. And uh, we usually tell that uh, our level of complexity is medium, so we try to simplify our models that are able to, uh, to fill it with data. And uh, regarding the accuracy, it is always the question of uh, measured and observed data. And uh, for example, in the mentioned agricultural cases, we usually uh, lean on the measurements, field measurements, where we can validate our models uh, to, to ensure the appropriate uh, preciseness of a model. So it can be precise only after an appropriate validation process. I see. I see. Um... And I was just wondering, uh, what could you, you gave already three very interesting examples. What sort of potential do you think this has? Are there, what other things do you think you could use this to model? Human systems that could be optimized or, or, or um, we could get value out of your Yes, regarding the optimization, formerly, uh, of course, it can be coupled uh, with uh, some meta heuristic tools like genetic algorithm. And uh, formerly, we did it in some cases. Now, it is these types of models are not uh, built for the purpose of optimization. But uh, and so it means that uh, these are not co coupled with optimization tools. But uh, but of course it is uh, allowed the uh, scenario analysis uh, that uh, with a validated model we can analyze quite different uh, underlying scenarios, hypothetical or existing scenarios. But of course uh, it it can be coupled. Uh, it is uh, possible to couple uh, this system uh, with optimization tools, of course. But it, it was not, not in the focus uh, in the past period. Because you also mentioned that uh, you were going to couple it with stoichiometric uh, aspects, yes. right? Yes. So are there, there's obviously a great number of things that you can couple it with to make it much more powerful. Are there, do you have some other examples of things that you can couple it with? Um, no, 
and then basically no uh, as i mentioned we, we plan to use uh, for this kind of uh, field applications and uh, regarding the further development uh, the main focus now is this stoichiometric direction because uh, this is the level that uh, that uh, can be considered as a medium level because it uh, can couple uh, both from the from the very lower level uh, component scale and the very higher level uh, evaluation scale. So now it is considered to be the main focus uh, for the future examples and the future applications. Excellent. Okay, so I will I will ask you, we have a couple of questions now from the audience. So I will I will switch over to those as those are actually the more important questions from our viewers. Um, so we have the first question here. Uh, you were talking about hydropower and at the same time hydrogen power. Which one is the main focus of discussion in your presentation? Maybe I misheard you, but I think you were basically saying that the hydrogen is used mm -hmm. to store yes. renew as a storage for renewable energy that yes. would otherwise be. Yes, you are right. But really, the hydropower was mentioned as an alternative energy source uh, to to produce the electrical energy. Uh, it was mentioned in this term, uh, but this hydrogen-related uh, system was only a, an obvious example that, that follows these natural structures. But uh, thanks for the question. Yes, uh, both the hydropower and hydrogen power was mentioned, but uh, in different terms. <laughs> uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the next question, I'm curious to learn if your system is able to quantify the advantages of circular systems as opposed to linear ones or possible disadvantages. Yes, uh, uh, it is the, the main aim because uh, with these uh, structural models, we describe, as I mentioned, uh, also the functionalities are embedded within our developed models and uh, it is the exact uh, exact point uh, when we can describe these systems quantitatively. So uh, it is uh, again one point that uh, several scenarios can be analyzed quantitatively uh, independently whether it is circular or not. And of course, uh, it is the main point uh, to, to plan uh, the more advantageous uh, circular systems that uh, that can be judged that quantitatively uh, more more advantageous. So uh, I hope that I I understood the questions appropriately. Uh, and the final question we have here, unless anyone wants to cut in now with another, uh, can this structure be adopted for both annual and perennial crops? Yes, uh, you know as I mentioned. Uh, uh, there are no validated uh, models uh, behind us, but usually we are working on actual data with the validation. And uh, in the recent example, we are working uh, uh, with annual crops now. And of course, it is always depend on, on the available uh, data and the interest, because usually the, the phenological stages and uh, the characteristics of the given crop uh, is determined and uh, added freely to the, to the functionalities of the model. So uh, my answer that if data is available, then yes, uh, both type of crops can be calculated. So it is a question of uh, available data for validation. We have a comment here, informative and explained with detail. Thank you very much. And I would also say thank you very much, Monica, for such a wonderful presentation. I did find it exceptionally interesting. Um, with that, I will say thank you very much for coming. Uh, and I will provide the closing remarks and the, uh, the information for the next um, webinar. <clears throat> so, uh, the next webinar, which will be Thursday week, so not the next Thursday, but the Thursday after, the Thursday, the November the 16th uh, at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time, will be from Edanto Lazi from the University of Ghent. He's going to be speaking with us on the topic of modeling waste feedstock availability and recycling options for circular economy, a case study for plastics. So um, 
a big thank you again so much to you, Monica, for coming. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. And your talk was very informative, very interesting. I loved all the diagrams. Um, and for me, for somebody that has this really very different to my research area, I really found it exceptionally interesting. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you, obviously, to everybody for, for coming today. Um, uh, to uh, We have another comment there. Thank you for the nice presentation. Another comment in the, in the Q&A. Um, yes, thank you also to everyone for coming. So uh, thank you again to everyone. And until... Thursday week. Uh, wish you all a good a good couple of weeks. Goodbye, everyone.